Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your Sunday evening to come and join us here at Telfair Museums for an event that I think is going to be exciting and thrilling. Um, my name is Robin Nicholson. I am the executive director and CEO of Telfair Museums. And one of the things that I feel is very important for us as a museum that celebrates culture in so many different ways is looking at what is culture. And in so many ways, not only is it visual culture, but it's food, it's wine, it's all of those things that make humanity special. And so for us as an art museum to celebrate all that that represents is something that I feel is very important. I think it's something we need to do more of. Uh, and as we look at the future of art museums, of museums in general, how can we pull together all of those aspects of what we enjoy in our lives and look at all of the different cultures that draw into our experience as human beings. And so tonight's event, I think, is going to be very special in considering many of those aspects because I know that Michael has really sort of focused so much on how African-American culture has influenced so many aspects of food culture, drink culture, culture in general. And so I'm looking forward to it very much indeed myself. I'm not going to take up your time because I know you want to hear from Michael, uh, but I do want to introduce um, my lead interpreter at the Owens Thomas House and at the Telfair in general, who is going to give a brief overview of how this kind of interrelates with many of the innovative strategies that we here at the Telfair are producing as an institution, uh, addressing so many different values that we hold dear. So uh, without any more ado, I would like to introduce Lilith Logan, who is going to give a brief presentation before she introduces uh, Jono, who is part of the sponsors of tonight's event. Thank you so much. Hi, all. Um, I'm Lilith. I'm the lead interpreter at the Owens Thomas House. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening. We're really excited. Uh, we're honored and delighted to co-host this lecture in conjunction with the Edna Lewis Foundation, not least because it brilliantly connects two of our major projects. Uh, the Slavery and Freedom in Savannah Project, which wrapped up last year in a grand reopening of the Owens Thomas House and Slave Quarters, and our current project, The Legacy of Slavery. For generations, museums across the nation have been dedicated to interpreting the lives of wealthy white families who inhabit a place, but have often neglected to recognize the immense contributions of enslaved people to those same places. We work tirelessly to change that narrative at the Owens Thomas House and Slave Quarters and across our sites. Um, visitors to the Owens Thomas House and Slave Quarters are now invited to explore the complicated relationships that existed between free and enslaved people in early 19th century Savannah, and I hope you'll all join us if you haven't. Uh, the Legacy of Slavery Project continues, continues that dialogue um, through town halls and lectures that focus on the lasting impact of American slavery on the daily lives and experiences of people in, um, of color, not just uh, during the emancipation and the years following, but up until today. This effort will cul culminate in an exhibition and symposium in fall of 2020, which I also hope you'll join us for. Now I'd like to introduce you all to um, Jono Morisano. He's the owner of a wonderful local eatery, The Gray. Also pay him a visit if you haven't already. Um, he also serves as the board on the board of the Edna Lewis Foundation. The Edna, Edna Lewis Foundation seeks to preserve and celebrate the rich Amer history of African American cookery by cultivating a deeper understanding of Southern food and culture. Um, so we're really happy to have um, him and Michael Twitty here for us tonight. So I wasn't supposed to do this. <laughs> and Mishama just walked in, but she's like, <laughs> um, I know. It's kind of the story of my life. Michael, let me just tell you, when I walked into this auditorium, my friend Kathy Solomons goes, and he's Jewish. <laughs> like the true good Jewish grandmother she is. Um, so I don't normally. I try not to just read, but I'm going to read some of Michael's bio because um, it's really um, immensely impressive. And you know, as a as a board member of the Edna Lewis Foundation, um, 
This all started with Michael and JJ Johnson, who's in the room, um, and Ashley Shanti coming down here for tomorrow night's annual dinner. A lot of folks in the room um, attend that each year um, to cook with Mishama and raise some money for the ELF. And when Michael agreed to come down and cook for that, or come over and cook for that, I guess, um, this idea got hatched of him doing a lecture here at the Tell Fair, and I called, I think, Catherine Renner, and she was like, I, I almost don't even know how it happened, but she responded to my email before it was fully sent. <laughs> and um, she was like, yes, we want to do it. Um, and so um, the Edna Lewis Foundation wants to thank the Telfair, Robin, Molly, Catherine, Lilith, everyone who, um, you know, the African American arts community, everyone who helped to arrange this kind of on the fly. So we appreciate that. So I am going to read you Michael's bio so I don't miss anything. I threatened to kind of ad lib it and he was like, they gotta know who they're hearing. I'm like, okay. Um, so, Mike, so Michael is a culinary historian and food writer. He was born in DC. His blog is Afro Culinaria. He's appeared on Bizarre Foods America with Andrew Zimmern, um, Many Rivers Cross with Dr. Henry Louis Gates, which is really impressive, um, and has lectured over 400 times. So this is 401. Um, he has served as a judge for the James Beard Awards and is a fellow with the Southern Foodways Alliance, another organization that is just so important to um, the preservation and furthering of Southern food and foodways. Um, and Ted, he was also the first revolutionary in residence at Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, and that just is cool as well. Um, Southern Living named um, Michael one of the 50 people changing the South, and he is number 45 on the root.com list of the most uh, influential African Americans in America. Um, he would like you to know that Beyonce beat him out as number one that year. So. <laughs> um, he also made the Jewish forwards list and the most influential American Jews. Um, I think that in, in 2017, Michael released a book called The Cooking Gene that you know, as someone who's really new to the South and new to Southern food, it really was kind of a game changer. And it became very, very quickly the Bible um, for Southern food. Like, you can't be in this industry if you haven't read it. And maybe more than once, because it's deep and it's layered. And when, you know, putting the joke of his Jewishness aside, the way he layers um, his faith with his history um, and the South and I don't know if you know this, but Michael is not afraid to poke the bear, um, and the way he does that. <laughs> um, and when he was doing um, research for the book, he called it the Southern Discomfort Tour, um, which I think was really, really um, fitting and appropriate. The book won like every award possible. He's like, I, I don't know, he somehow won 17 James Beards for it. Um, <laughs> and so, is that is is that is that a is that a have I hit all the high points? Uh, all right. Um, he, I mean, we're just, we couldn't be, we're beyond honored to have him. Um, yeah, Bon Appetit, Peace on Ghana. Um, he just like, the, the guy's the real deal. So without further ado, please welcome Michael Twitty. something at the last minute dang <laughs> I'm impressed I'm really impressed um I hope everyone can kind of hang for the next at least the next 45 minutes because that's just the without questions and answers we even got into the, the, the 15 20 minutes of questions and answers and um it's a long story right and people want different things out of the narrative that I offer them um, I really appreciate what John said about the book. Um, to be the first black American author to win Book of the Year at James Beard after winning writing was um, proof positive. You would think that this project, telling my family's story from Africa to America, from slavery to freedom, through food would be an instant, where do we sign up? But it's really important for me to tell you, in talking with my colleague just the other day ago 
on another major product, project that's happening. Um, this, this is still, it's still hard for us to sell, to promote, and to empower these narratives in the media. Uh, this was not supposed to do anything. I hustled my tuchus and made this work. Um, I used social media for all it was worth, but originally nobody, it's like, okay, we'll give you a little bit of a chance. Let's see what you can do on your own terms and your own way. And one of the first discussions about the cooking gene that I had, um, I wrote it, you know, I remember I wrote a little Savannah native, a letter a couple years ago, and she ain't never wrote me back. <laughs> Bless her heart. <laughs> In parentheses, sips water. I'm gonna replay that poke the bear part. <laughs> My fiance will find that very funny. Um, <laughs> I'm so off color. <laughs> Anyhow, black people do blush. <laughs> um, that was, you know, was a moment. For, the moments for me was that that gave me the opportunity to take the Southern discomfort tour and all the work I'd put into it, and imagine a project a book, a film, or something, right? And so then I had all these agents, then I had one agent, and then we had all these publishers, and then we had five publishers, and then we had, um, we knew we could not do this bare bones. I needed a lot of time. I needed to go do more travel, more research. It's simply, I couldn't do this for cheap. And one of the publishers, um, who will remain nameless until I get that Guggenheim or something, was just basically like, you know, you're Jewish, you're black, you're gay, you're too complicated. And I said, this is the only country where I'm possible. And if you take that away from me, fuck your America. <laughs> so, so for real, I was just like angry because I was just like, I have a Puerto Rican Jewish girl, a regular Ashkenazi Jewish girl from New York, from Long Island, and an Egyptian, Muslim woman telling me, I'm not possible. <laughs> Remember when y'all weren't allowed to read and write? And neither was I? God does amazing things all the time. And I was just angry because I was just like, my America was here before your America was. And we were doing things, we still doing things, we still in this. But it was a great pleasure to see some of those very same people at that very self-same theater awards and being able to say the words, some of y'all didn't think I needed a voice. Some of y'all think I didn't deserve a voice. And some of y'all said I was too complicated. I am America. Don't you ever forget it. 1619 and 2019 ain't going nowhere. And didn't get to be 400 by being stupid. <laughs> so that's that. Okay. But that's how people are. And I'm glad that you recognize the, the layers because this, this is not an everyday thing. Not everybody can go in deep on their family story. First of all, it's a really emotional, soul-wrenching work. You know, when you realize you're not just here because you breathe and you're lucky and things have lined up. You're here because somebody decided that, no, you were not a slave. You were not been meant to be enslaved that people in your family resisted enslavement, that people in your family were cooks of renown, that people in your family fought to preserve their African identities and languages and cultures, that that's what you come from, that you didn't have to, you didn't have to write a book. My grandfather, a blessed memory, who died last year at 99, he reminded me of that. He said, I picked cotton so you could pick up a book. And I said, okay, that's what's up. And I remember when I was 18 years old, August Wilson, um, one of my um, great um, idols, he came to Howard University where I was starting college and um, he was the star of the hour. And August Wilson, um, the author of Fences, The Piano Lesson, 
Joe Turner's come and gone, and other amazing plays. Had a 10-year cycle translated through the world of Pittsburgh's Hill District, his, the neighborhood he grew up in. And he died of cancer um, a bit ago, or a little over a decade ago. But on that fall day, he said, I guess he did a presentation. He was a lion of a man. I mean, he was so, he was a nice, he was, he was as you say, we say in Yiddish, he had a um, zissen, a zissen soul, a sweet soul. And um, I asked the first question, I was nervous, and he answered the question. The question was, how come you wanted us to stay in the South? You never lived in the South. You're from Pittsburgh, you know, it's the only life you've ever known. But why do you say we should have stayed? He said, because we had our, we had our land, we had our food, we had access to nature, we were fighting interrogation. We had our own businesses where we had to go to each other and buy from, and our own schools and our teachers who taught us that we were the best, and we were not so inferior, had to look, do anything else but just be our best selves. We had our own world. We were con in control of that world. And that was an extraordinary answer. And then um, I scrounged together, I mean literally like the, the whole college kid pocket, change pocket thing and bought a copy of Joe Turner's Come and Gone to accompany my, co my copy of Fences and the piano lesson. And I got in the long line, when I got up to him, he still had like people out the door. And he said, you're that young man asking that question. And I said, yes sir, and he said, I wanna talk to you. So for like, I don't know, it, was, it seemed like an eternity, it was really more like eight minutes, which you know, if you are in a line with a famous author, eight minutes is a long time. And it was him doing almost all the talking, and I said to him, Mr. Mr. Wilson, I said, what am I, what am I going to write about? What am I going to do? And he looked at me and he said, I want you to go back to the South and find Africa for your grandmother. And I was like stone, you know. It was like he was reading me, right? And he gave me this big hug, signed all my books, and off I went. Just like magical. Absolutely magical. And when I started The Cooking Gene, you know, I kind of appealed to that moment. And I remember going to the grave of Alex Haley. Um, and I was just like, uh, Alex Haley is buried in the, in the front lawn of his grandmother's home in Henning, Tennessee, where he initially heard the stories that became Roots. And um, I'm really proud to say that I'll be taking a group of black chefs to the village of Jufere in the Gambia, where his family started next March, um, which for me is like total the cycle, you know, the whole cycle. Um, and I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. This scares me. I don't, people are gonna come at me. They're gonna say, I don't know what I'm talking about, or it's not good enough, or I'm not good enough. I need to get back home to Africa. I don't know how I'm gonna do that. I have no money, how am I gonna do this? I said, can you please hook a brother up? And I, I have to say that between the love of my mother and heaven, my um, many ancestors, and Alex, and August, and a little bit of Romare Beard, and I, I've, been pre I've done pretty good. But you stand on the shoulders of giants wherever you go. So I want to talk to you, um, I really want to go into a little bit about some of the kind of zoom in and zoom out. I don't necessarily want to give a cooking gene talk so much as I really want to help people appreciate how this work works and how it the, the mechanics of it. Um, this isn't about making food from day to day on a line people can eat. That is a very strong, admirable work. But that's not what I do. I don't, I'm not a food critic. Well, I am a food critic, because that's, you know. But not that kind of food critic. <laughs> and I don't walk around incognito because I'm like <laughs> saying your greens suck or something. But um, I just wanted to devote myself when I started learning about living history, um, every field that I wanted to go into was not me. It was mainly white females. It wasn't me. It was like, okay, I was the only, used to, was only one of a handful of men in the room. Um, certainly only one to have a handful of openly queer people in the room. Um, and definitely one of the few black people, if only the black person in the room, you know. I, I call that effect the raisin the kugel effect. You know, just, I said it. Um, listen, y'all came for a thrill and I came to give it. 
So, I mean, that's how I, f I was. I was like, I can't just be the only one, and I want this to grow, and I want to be. I want to cook. I want to. I I went from using whatever I could get my hands on because it was affordable, to slowly but surely investing in. You know, the wooden bowls, the pot. I mean, the the pots, the pans, the aluminum, the this, the tin, the the. Those of you who know reenactment and living history interpretation, know this is not cheap. This is like drag queen bills. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I don't. I don't know what I've spent more on. You know, cast iron pots or tights. I don't know, <laughs> but I do know that it's just exhausting. And you have to really, you really be dedicated to knowing how to take care of those utensils, and you know, the clothing alone. When you see me in that same outfit, there's a reason for that. That's a $2,700 outfit, believe it or not. It's no joke. And the fact of the matter is, for African Americans, um, this is a particularly painful history. I mean, lots of us want to play glory. Nobody wants to play roots, and I wonder why. Because one is nobling, and one sounds, uh, but I don't reenact slavery, and I want to make that very clear. Reenactors are very noble people, and occasionally. There are, there are our cousins of dubious mental um, um, health. Um, one gentleman once threw a plastic uh, dish rack in a fire because he said, in this camp, it is always 1755. Wow. Whereas an interpreter would be like, this, I, this material object is inappropriate for our time period. Let's just put it beneath the, you know, we wouldn't burn it in a fire and go, yeah. Death to penicillin! I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, what is that? That's kind of naughty. Um, I don't want that reality. Um, thanks. Um, wow. I mean, I love Roman history, too. Doesn't mean I want to um, clean myself with a sponge and vinegar and seawater. <laughs> yeah, you know, y'all were like, ouch. Uh, you know, like, I don't want no Roman sponge. <laughs> I barely like the one I have at home. Now... <laughs> That having been said, you will never forget that, will you? Because um, you got to go two or three times a day anyway. Um, but that's why I like doing this, because it is visceral. It is literally, literally in your kitchen, because it's literally in your gut, where your, not, or your other form of knowledge is. You know, when you look at um, sculpture, um, power objects, what white people used to call amulets and other kind of nonsense words, the power objects, power in West Africa, Central Africa, is always here in the gut. The, where the medicine goes, where the spiritual, you know, the energizing force behind what makes that object a spiritual beacon goes in the gut. Because that's where our other intelligence is. That's why we have to say, I have a feeling. I have a notion, my intuition. So this is, a very, this is also a very spiritual thing. And there is no academic, no scholarly way to translate that feeling to other people. It's like jazz. You either know what jazz is or you don't. You either feel it or you don't. You either hear it or you don't. It's its own language. Um, and then there's a very, very serious scholarly part of the work. Um, and that means, yeah, I can, we can talk all day long about whose barbecue is whatever and how it's flavored and whether you not put sugar in your cornbread, or whether or not canned greens are better than fresh greens, and blah, 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 blah. And you can do that all you want. That has no bearing on the long struggle and story that gets food to our plates. You know, when Heston Blumenthal, a very respected British chef, talks nonsense about how women would fare better in the kitchens if they were stronger and had better biological clocks, I really want to bring this full um, back in time and show him that 99% um, of our meals have been prepared by those women and their biological clocks and their strong arms and strapping backs and bodies that produce children that produced him. What a, what a, what a, ugh. <laughs> you know, there's a phrase in Yiddish that I love. It's Fleisch mit Eugen. You know what that means? It means you're so stupid, you're like meat with eyes. <laughs> God didn't give you anything else but just, floating, right? Um, and it's, it's, 
painful because the guy is talented and he does glorious culinary history, but we are erasing women. You cannot erase women from this story. You cannot erase people of color from this story. The arc, I, we were talking, I was talking with um, uh, Chef Jeremiah and, um, and Monticello. We're talking about James Hemings, of course, and Jefferson in France. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, we're forgetting another very important nation to the history of Virginia cooking. It's called Nigeria. And Nigeria is a hell of a lot older than France. You know, let's go deep on this. And you have to be able to give the receipts and be interdisciplinary. That's another thing about it. It's not just about the cooking. It's about your ability to be able to translate to statistics and go into geography and understand how the different parts of an animal's body and the plant system. We need to go back into the, all that stupid sepal and pistol nonsense that you thought you left behind. Remember that, remember that stupid test? You had, to cut, you had to color things in and label them and when am I ever going to use this? <laughs> right? And you have to know something about blood types and know something about um, DNA and human evolution and the whole, everything goes into it. There's just nothing that can be left behind. And it's so specific. I mean, look at Georgia. Savannah was once the only chunk of Georgia, right? Until. And when Savannah was the main chunk of Georgia, and then the geography spreads out from the Georgia Low Country into the Georgia coastal plain into the Piedmont, we're talking about migration patterns. You know, the initial groups who came into Georgia were cast off from Charleston, South Carolina were providing enslaved people, and then the slave trade became legal. And then people were brought predominantly, and it was a very slim period. It was roughly like seven, the 1750s through the 1780s, and then when the trade picked up again, you know, right before it closed, you had people from Sierra Leone, from Liberia, from Senegal, from Guinea, from Guinea-Bissau. These were all the rice growers because by the time Georgia picks up as a colony, they've been able to learn from South Carolina. They know exactly who they want to buy and who brings this knowledge. Who brought that knowledge? Black women from the rice growing areas of West Africa. Knowledge that would give a successful white planter within two seasons millionaire status in his day without ever having to move an inch of the land. That was the men's job. More land was moved in the American low country to make way for rice fields and dams and impoundments than was used to build the pyramids of Giza. And the scar is still on the land from outer space. That's an extraordinary narrative because it's not just about the food and the plant, it's about the intellectual know-how, acknowledging sun cycles and rhythms and seasons and when the water is brackish or fresh, you have to have fresh water to grow rice. You know, and they also, you know, crops like cattle and millet and sorghum and indigo and cotton, all of which were also being grown in the same region in Africa at the same time. Okra, black-eyed peas, peanuts, a.k.a. groundnuts, taro, elephant ear. To this day, you've noticed you see a lot of elephant in the low country, right? You see it everywhere. Everywhere you see it growing big clumps, you can almost bet a black community used to live there. The same food the Hawaiians call poi, right? Kalo. And the Hawaiians do something really interesting. They say, Kalo is our brother. You know, like native, like native Southerners, the Cherokee, the Creek, the Muscogee, the Chickasaw said, the Seminole said, corn is our mother. And in Nigeria, they say yams are our family. You see, when you're of color, you're black and brown, your food and you are the same. You are genetically bound. You are spiritually bound. You are as if you came from the same womb. That's, that's, that's the kind of stuff they don't teach you in culinary school. This isn't about, this isn't about sous vide <laughs> This isn't about, you know, cutting things a certain way or medium dice, isn't about a, having a good scald. It's about the kind of things that you can only learn through, through spirit and through mind. You know, when a, a very 
res uh, a Georgian who I respect a lot, Chef Matthew Rayford, the chef farmer says, culinary school taught him at a cost to say in French what his grandmother taught him for free in Ebonics. <laughs> and that's pretty accurate. Um, we forget that these cooks, men and women, they're extraordinary. Especially when you talk about Savannah and Charleston. Have I ever tell you my Charleston story before? I gotta say this. So the first time I came to Savannah from Charleston, someone I know who a lot of people in this room know, but I can't say their name, said to me, oh, Michael, you're going, we in Charleston love our sister city, Savannah. Albeit she is a sluttier sister. <laughs> I was like, that is some live oak Spanish moss shade. Like, you can make a ton of wigs out of that. Like, wow. Is that, is that how y'all really feel? Dang. Hate to catch up to some bourbon. Um, but I found a lot in this area to be very, you know, proud of. You know, my ancestors, when at least several of my ancestors, my ancestor Rachel Ware and others, came through Savannah. You know, this is, I, I, when I go past the river, you know, I have that same feeling that I get when I'm in Charleston and I'm, I'm down on Gadsden's Wharf or Sullivan's Island. Um, I know this is, the, this is the place where my family became American. And it's an eerie and very sobering feeling akin to what one might feel if they went to Ellis Island or Angel Island or some other space. It's just that feeling of, yeah, this is where it happened. And it's all full cycle. The reason why we even talk about this, it's not about phenotype, it's not about color. I really want you to, to, to diffuse that. It's about, you know, when we, th when we talk about race, race is a stupid word. Because it doesn't mean anything. Food is, rea is a reality. Race is an illusion. But unfortunately, racism is not. It's like werewolves. Ain't none of y'all ever seen a werewolf. <laughs> but the fear of werewolves has been very real, right? People have actually lost their lives because people thought that people had lycanthropy. They were becoming animals. When in reality, it might have been a number of unfortunate circumstances. Um, but that's a reality, right? The, 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 dis, the, the, the fear, the phobia, the distaste, the, the concern that we, are, we become other. Racism is reality, race is not. But when we say race, what we really mean is three or four things. Phenotype, that's what we really mean by race, right? His skin is brown, his nose is flat. His eyes are almond shaped, his hair is sort of curly. Okay. He looks Afrikoid. Although we all know in the room that's like that little tiny 1% behind the dot. And then there's ethnotype. Ethnotype you can choose. In any given moment we can shift ethnotypes. No matter what we think, how unnatural that might be. People have been doing it for millennia. That's how we got to be here. And there's genotype, which you cannot change. Genotype may mean you are any number of things. It means you might be wearing later hose in one day. You might be wearing a kilt the next day, right, Ancestry? That's how simple it is. You just open up Ancestry and you, all of a sudden you change your wardrobe. And uh, that's, that's, that's what it's all about. <laughs> you know, <laughs> easy as pie. So genotype, ethnotype, and phenotype, just the beginning building block in this weird concept. We give a solid damn about race in America and the West. We have, as the words um, of Anna DeVere Smith, really lousy language because we're obsessed with it but we're not willing to give the language to it to reverse the cancer. So food is my tool in doing that deconstruction work and also building up our identity one of the things that was proud about, proudest about the cooking gene, and you know, no author is proud of their book, I assure you, because there's always mistakes. 
There's always things you wish you put in or went on longer or didn't talk about, you know. One thing I was proud of was after the fact I realized I wrote this book from our perspective. It wasn't about what the white people did for us. It's about how we created their palate. It's about how we fed ourselves out of love. It's about the corn husk palate that our ancestors made the children that would become our great great grandparents on. It was about our relationships and our emotional struggles and our struggle to preserve our culture. I remember a woman, I met a woman from Savannah at Colonial Williamsburg, and she was not a bigot per se. She just wasn't aware. And I felt bad for her because she really didn't understand her Americanness. Because you can't understand your Americanness without understanding your Africanness. Because she literally said the words, I grew up eating crab rice and okra soup and she crab soup and peanut this and oyster this and rice all the time and a black woman cooked for my family and I did not know that that came from West Africa. I didn't know that a door that was painted pink blue came from West Africa. And I didn't come at her with negativity. I said, well, <laughs> you're learning it now. Welcome to the club, welcome to the family. You've always been in the family, but you never knew you were. And that's really what it's all about. Breaking down those walls. Having people understand that there is something noble and ennobling about our tradition, our food. I, don't, I will never give up the moniker soul food. I believe it's an incredibly powerful name because our cuisine is the only one named after something that is invisible and eternal that you can feel like love and God and I'm so proud of that. We have the only transcendentally named cuisine, soul food. It gets right to the damn point. You know, you can do, you can, you can put all the, you can, you can do all the techniques and put all the flavors in it and call it what you want, but until you got that intuition, that mother wit, that common sense, that spiritual direction, that ancestral wisdom, you know, you don't know what jazz is. And it's remarkable because you look at the quilts, you look at the music, you look at the way we, we, we rock our booties, you look at the way we pray, you look at the way we die, the way we mourn each other, and it's the same language across different mediums. And I didn't know that until I, until I went into this two, two feet deep. And I mean, I'm not here to really talk about my next project a lot, which is kosher soul, which is a whole other ball game. I have to kind of keep those two things separate from because it's a lot, you know, a lot of noise, a lot of stuff going on. But when I was teaching Hebrew school for 14 years, why have all these white hairs? Um, one thing, I taught about the Shoah, I taught about the Holocaust. And my students didn't understand the Shoah beyond it being this grotesque event. They seemed like this really awful, real life human video game. And here we are living in the shadow of the United States Holocaust Museum. And I was like, well, where do your people come from? They couldn't tell me where that fa how their families got there. And so we started cooking and researching and identifying their place in the history. I remember there was a cookbook called In Memory's Kitchen that my friend Cara De Silva edited. And In Memory's Kitchen was all about the women of Theresa Stott, Hitler's model ghetto, and how they um, survived, quote unquote, by remembering the delicacies they ate when they were still eating. And then after doing this for several years, I realized something. Someone could and should do this for African Americans to give voice to the men and women, but especially the mothers who were cooking in those cabins and, and in also in those plantation kitchens and urban households. That they had a voice too that needed to be rescued, needed to be recovered, and they had names that needed to be known. So when I wrote my blog, I did, the blog was not about how to, get the how to produce the best fried chicken. If you want to do that, there's like a million blogs that all get it wrong, but okay, you can go see them. <laughs> but if you come to me, I want you to know the names of the women who made that fantasy and reality possible. I want you to know the names of the men who were in that fine um, clothing in the big house, who were the chefs of renown, the James Heming, the Hercules, Abraham, Robert, they have, sometimes I just like 
could get lists of their names and say them out loud. Betty Randolph, enslaved woman to Betty Randolph, cook of Peyton Randolph's house. That's where I'm getting married, by the way. I decided, I'm not, it's not about having a plantation wedding. It's about literally, I'm getting married on the steps of that kitchen out of gratitude. I'm sorry. I want the ancestors to be present. I want them to be there when I make a life transition. Because I want them to understand without them, I wouldn't be where I am. When I talk to her a lot, you know, when I go in the kitchen and cook in Williamsburg, and I'll, I'll talk to her, like, when I go there later this week and, like, break it down and be like, thank you for not, never letting my chicken burn. <laughs> and thank you for helping me tell your story. And thank you for opening the doors to that woman in Savannah who didn't know that she had been robbed of part of the American story. Not because it's her fault, because we do a lot of obfuscating in erasure. We don't understand. It's not just about black people here. When you go to the continent and you see the roots of these things, you see how people do them. And the little things like, you know, when I was tasting food in Nigeria and Ghana, and I put the food on the back of my, the sauce in the back of my hand and went like that, and all the women stopped and went silent. And then I kind of caught on to the fact that they were just like, they started nodding, and they were just like, yeah, you had a mother who 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 taught you the right way, who taught you this is how it's done. You're one of us. You know, between that and the dancing, <laughs> that's tough. But I'm always, but I, I guarantee you, whatever village I go to, I'm always the best dancer. And they can't play me on that one. Uh -uh, that's serious business, too. It's like a calling card. You go, and then all of a sudden, the drums start up, and they expect you to, like, co get it and cooperate. And the one who, got, who has the beat down the most, who can get those movements down, is they say, uh-huh, you come back to us. You are our ancestor, come back to us. And I was eating with the kitchen staff in Senegal, in Dakar, the first night I was there. And this really beautiful woman named Fanta, she said to me, Michael, you are our new family, but you, says, we are your new family, but you are our old family. That feeling of both welcome home and self-discovery, the feeling that food is text, the very black diaspora and the very Jewish diaspora idea that food is an actual text in and of itself. Food is a language of both love and faith in one's culture, one's identity, one's origin. And that it can be shared to a point, but must have translation. That is all present in black food. There's a reason why when we go eat Haitian food, or Brazilian food, Jamaican food, Barbadian food, Antiguan food, food from Dominica, food from the Garifuna people in Belize, Afro-Mexican cuisine, we go, Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Because we understand it. We know how we know the faces of the mamas that cook it, and the aunties that cook it, and the uncles that cook it, and the barbecue that comes out of a tradition, and the deep frying. All that means something to us. So it's this work is about recovery. It's about search. It's about discovery. It's about healing. It's about hope. It's about providing people with the, the tools to have a better food future in black and brown communities. Because how do we, how do we start off the Aztecs, the Hawaiians, West Africans with these amazing indigenous diets, right? Warrior producing diets, matriarch queen producing diets, and look at the same descendants of the people today. For us, assimilation has not always been the best thing. We have to address that subject. For us, a, what is a paleo diet to us? That's your, that's your diet, where you came from, in Northern Europe. What does that mean to us? 
You mean to tell an Incan he can't have a potato? <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. That potato's got to go. <laughs> Nonsense. You know, we really have to rethink the whole, the whole shebang, the whole process. So I don't, I don't really want to um, go on too much longer. I do want to have a little bit of a dialogue. I will warn you, though. Um, I probably should talk about Closure of Souls if we kind of make that boundary, close it, because I know people ask about that a lot. I, I, don't, I don't feel questions about my Jewish identity un until this book is over, next book is over. Um, part of the reason is it really doesn't have much to do with the idea of um, black food and empowerment except for me and my black Jewish brothers and sisters who do similar work. Another thing is that I'm not exotic. Um, we've been rocking this black Jewish thing since Zipporah and Moses, so don't, don't go there. <laughs> you know, Sammy Davis wasn't the first, and I'm not going to be the last, so bye. Um, as, as, a, as a gay man, as a black gay man, the kitchen was often the place of refuge for those of us who were different and remains that place. And I feel very, you know, whole in the sense of all these identities kind of feeding to each other, expressing, you know, how I feel about food. Um, food ways isn't, is the food good or not? Is it burnt or not? Is it, is it tasty? Is it not tasty? Does it have enough salt It's prepared properly? Is your technique great? That's not food ways, that's cuisine. Food ways is a sociological part of the food. Why do we identify with certain things? Why do we get angry when we see certain things? You know, why, do, why does the idea of hollowing out a bagel, like totally tray? <laughs> or, you know, why do we get bristled if we are Asian Pacific Islanders at the, at the notion of oriental salad? What the hell is that? You know, wow. You might as well just call it racist salad. <laughs> you know, how about I make some Western salad, throw in some imperialism, <laughs> cultural appropriation, all the usual ingredients, you know, genocidal slaughter, <laughs> Eurocentric beauty standards, just a Western salad. <laughs> Tasty as hell. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Every rabbi is a comedian. Every black comedian is a preacher. <laughs> Remember I said that. TM, the chocolate chosen. Now, we have time for some questions, yeah? Yeah, okay, great. I, I just, I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna make this about one, one, one thing. I wanted to show you the breadth of the whole picture. You know, it's taken me a long time um, I guess my whole life, but really 35 plus years, really 12, 15 years of doing interpretation, um, really, I don't know how many years of being obsessed with this and really trying to follow its logical, con logical conclusion. My goal being to have a folk school one day where I can teach people everything I know and bring in other people who know more than I do or know other parts that I don't know so we can share knowledge. Because I really do believe that the, um, the people of the African diaspora and Afro-Atlantic have created something remarkable. I mean, Southern food, even when, it's, when the forms themselves are not direct from the continent, bear our stamp. We are the catalyst in the story, the narrative. And it's a billion, multi-billion dollar industry. You know, just like the music that we've, I mean, it, I mean, yes, we get told all sorts of nasty things like our food is unhealthy and, you know, because all black culture has to be pathology until it's proven marketable by white people. <laughs> we all know I, I said some truth. <laughs> like, like, why do our boys get sent to the principal's office for speaking the same language that other people get paid billions of dollars for in the form of when it's set to a beat? Or told they don't speak properly when they're only really speaking their, lang their vernacular language, you know? or the fact that we do code switch. And you know, I love wearing my t-shirt, too, too tired to code switch. <laughs> I like wearing that at the airport. <laughs> TSA, the, the my greatest two TSA moments were when the guy read the t-shirt that said too tired to code switch, and the other one had to read my t-shirt out loud after he searches my whole you know, corpus, and he goes, proud, 
queer Jew of color. Wow. So let's, let's have a little bit of a chat because I'm actually eager to go eat the gray with my, my kinfolk. And I, and I want to acknowledge my, my chef, my, um, my chef brother and um, uh, friend brother of 20 some years, Valon Murky. Wave, chef Valon, wave your hand. Um, <laughs> apart from the glorious thing of cooking with Mashama and JJ, um, Chef Valon and I remarked just this afternoon that, you know, we're coming from DC from our particular background, both becoming culinary people. It's kind of amazing. It's, it's heart, it's, it's sobering that we are the saving remnant of so many people that we've known and grew up with are no longer here, but we still here doing what we gotta do. So I appreciate him being here as a form of support, but also just his friendship and kinship with me. Cause you know, that's how we do. Where family is important to us. That's what it's all about. Thanks guys.